Hello everyone and welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the horror program at the University of the Underground. I'm a student at the University of the Underground and I'm here with Mob Fellow researchers and Aggie Haynes, head of the horror program, which is a critical exploration into elicited societal fears and human passion for horror. We will be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dram dramaturgy. <laughs> film, costume making, and more. The University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic, and transnational university founded in 2017 and birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. We are non-profit and a registered charity, so if you would like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org. On this website, you can also find other exciting programs and events. You can find other films online on our Instagram. Thank you, Emily. Amazing. So today we've got some really great people joining us. We have Alexander Cromer. Alexander Cromer is a storyteller, researcher, master of ceremonies and a designer of experiences from the United States. His focus revolves around creating speculative futures and histories as a means of investigating the African dysphoria at proposed the North Atlantic and subsequently the Middle Passage. As a researcher and designer, he has incorporated transdisciplinary models, primarily poetry, performance and music to produce experiences for the Dutch nat National Opera and Ballet, uh, the British Film Institute, Excel Recordings, the annual International Conference of Youth, D School, Amsterdam, We Transfer and Black Lives Matter movement in the US. And he's currently the project manager of the high school of the University of the Underground. And we also have Lauren Alexander. So thank you for joining us. Lauren's a South African designer, artist, research and co-founder of Foundland Collective. Lauren tutors graphic design students at the Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. Since 2009, Lauren works extensively with Syrian designer and artist Gahala Eskarbi. I really, I, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> As, as Foundland Collective, drawing together disciplines of art, new media, graphic design, and writing to critically reflect upon what it means to produce politically engaged decolonial storytelling from their position as non-Western artists working between Europe and the Middle East. Foundland Collective have been nominated for the Prix de Rome, the Dutch Design Awards, and the Fellows of the Smithsonian Artist Research Programme. So thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm gonna hand over to the both of you. Thank you, Aggie. That was a really elaborate uh, introduction. Thanks a lot. Um, well, we, we had planned to introduce ourselves, but I think, I think you've done the business. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, Alex, what else should we add to that, maybe? maybe? Yeah, I, I just have one slight corre correction, Aggie, and, and also everyone else. Um, because I am I'm no longer um, uh, supervising High School of the Underground. I am working at Cafe Ka now with, with Lauren Alexander um, and uh, chasing after my PhD at PhD Arts at the University of Leiden um, in, in the Netherlands. So just, yeah, just slight correction, just because I know Nelly is going to be watching this in the, in the future, so. <laughs> We're just adding to the, updating the bio, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so I, I mm -hmm. guess um, we'll just take it away from, from here. Uh, today we are going to talk about institutions and uh, namely uh, collaborations with institutions, which is something that's really important for all of you in the current brief. Um, so I briefly introduced myself uh, a couple of days ago when we met and explained uh, a little bit about um, yeah, what we would talk about today and we'll, we'll take, pick it up from here. Um, so yeah, institutional collaboration during the context of the University of the Underground has always been a, a fundamental part of the program and has always been something that's quite uh, a challenge for students to, to think about how to, to deal with if you've never done that before. Um, and I presume that most of you come from an, an arts background or maybe, um, I don't know, performance background, um, maybe design background. And um, well, the different modes for collaboration that we've encouraged are, have been quite varied and also up to the student to decide according to their research preferences. Um, so I think it's really important. Um, yeah, and we, we're going to give you some tips, I guess, from the lessons that we've learned along the way. 
So I'll uh, start off by just going through a couple of projects to point out different modes of collaboration. Um, yeah, also things to remember during the whole process of working. And um, yeah, basically tips and tricks really and the, and the lessons that we've learned through examples. And then I think Alex will pick up with uh, his, um, well, graduation. Uh, pro well, part of the graduation was in your second year of the study, I guess. Um, you, were, you were collaborating um, with a, uh, what was it, a boxing a studio? Is that yeah. the correct term? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a Thai kickboxing studio. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to say like a Thai kickboxing studio, that that is not um, per se what comes to mind when you think of institution, but it's definitely a valid group or community um, center or I mean yours was also very much connected to the um, migrant background of the person who started that uh, center so uh, yeah a pretty pretty open interpretation I guess of the word institution um, is also something that we'd like to emphasize so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just to get started with my story Ooh, my the host disabled me um host please and um, please enable me <laughs> okay hmm. sorry you should be able to now <laughs> yeah 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 got it cool uh sure one second okay um Alrighty. Um, ooh, sorry, not used to Zoom. Um, okay, so I'm gonna. There we go. Um, okay, this is just my name again, Lauren Alexander. And just to say that, um, yeah, I've been tutoring at the University of the Underground since since 2017, and now working at the Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. Uh, together with Alex. Uh, that's why we've been together all day at school, because we are still teaching in real life, which is great. Um, so yeah, field work and collaborations. Uh, the word field work, I'm not too sure that that comes up too much in the um, University of the Underground uh, course. I don't know what Alex uh, remembers or thinks about that, but um, <laughs> I guess it's a word taken from anthropology. But I like the word because um, well, it's, it's, yeah, just saying basically everything outside of the, the classroom uh, consists of valuable input for your projects, whether that be for on an informational level, like to gather information, to speak to experts, um, or uh, as something which feeds into your material production in the end. So what is field work? I guess it is anything basically self-initiated or organized um, by the University of the Underground or initiated or kind of facilitated by them. Could be trips, could be meetings, could be any kind of knowledge exchange outside of the school setting. Um, designed to understand a problem or your topic or yeah, your theme of choice through the experience of expertise or expertise of others. Um, I say problem because I guess that is generally an artistic practice what we kind of um, tr do in a sense is to problematize or critique a certain issue. Um, well, maybe you might have a different interpretation of, of what your practice is or how you operate, but still I think it's always useful to uh, reach out to others outside of the institution and outside of the expertise of the University of the Underground to yeah, seek further verification on what you're working on and to just either touch base or to collect information from outside of a school setting. Um, so this, as I said, could, could contribute to you actually harvesting your information and or also contribute to the actual material production of your artistic outcome. And in my experience, uh, especially with the graduation projects, um, whether that be on MA or BA level, it usually ends up being the case that through the field work, uh, the documentation is often used as part of the, the end product, whether that be just a sampling of some things found along the way or 
the actual documentation um, of the field work uh, as you're going. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, this quote, um, and it's from the text, The Ignorant Schoolmaster. The ignorant schoolmaster does not teach his pupils his knowledge, but orders them to venture into the forest of things and science to say what they have seen, to verify it and have it verified. Um, I really like this because I think at least I, it really resonates with me and, and how I learn. And um, I recently did a test uh, on, on it's, a, it's a questionnaire. Actually, I'd like to share it with you maybe um, in the chat later. It's a questionnaire which uh, helps you to verify what type of learner you are, whether you're a visual learner, a reading, writing learner, or a kinetic learner. And I discovered I'm a kinetic learner. And I, I think I really relate to this idea of going out into the world, seeing things, experiencing things, and then actually talking about them to other people. Um, and thereby, I really uh, resonate with this idea of like verifying things and that, that by doing that, actually learning and having that knowledge really stay with me. And I think also, even in the writing of my MA thesis, I, um, I think I really benefit from this kind of like journaling, daily journaling and um, yeah, sort of verifying my ideas and also trying to connect that to, to theory. Um, so really like experiencing uh, theory through practice. Um, why is it important to do this? Well, um, Hmm. I don't know. I guess this is also like really subjective whether, um, yeah, maybe some people actually don't think that field work uh, benefits their practice. It could be, but I guess it's just a, it's a premise actually. It's one of the underlying um, principles, I guess, at the University of Underground. But I would say that it's really useful in terms of gaining a broader context with, you know, outside of the artistic practice of your so-called problem um and situating that within a real world a context to avoid actually this general sort of like assumptions that we might make around uh, about the world around us um yeah and also to understand maybe what the impact of whatever kind of project that we might make and the artistic practice or the outcomes of it uh against other other disciplines and yeah maybe it's a bit of a reality check as well um, if you have certain ideas and then also kind of check that with, with those who are working in the field or, or in a certain organization to see how, how that would actually communicate within a different context. Um, so yeah, today, I guess we sit in strange times in the Netherlands, we are almost back to lockdown situation again. Um, but uh, when we first started this program called Turquoise Desert, which was the, um, well, it was the, the first um, program, the research residency of the University of the Underground that was taking place just before Corona times. Um, so that was the end of 2019. And uh, we were doing a research project about food and water. And for this, we actually traveled to Egypt for two weeks, which was really incredible. Um, especially uh, for everyone, this, this trip and the overnight stay in the white desert um, in Egypt. I'm not sure if anyone, well, I think we have actually one Egyptian participant among us. Um, and I really believe in, the, in, in just the value of immersive experiences like this and thinking about just water. And um, we did a lot of uh, tours in, in Cairo related to the Nile and um, the ancient aqueduct that is there and the sabils, uh, which are like uh, ancient sort of water uh, fountains in the city. So we did a lot of, um, kind of field trips related to water, but just the experience of being in the desert and, and, and really feeling water scarcity was really valuable. Um, so even in these crazy times when it's really difficult to, to travel and to maybe plan things, um, I would highly suggest thinking in your local environment of just traveling to whether that be like a park or a, a special space where you could actually experience a certain, yeah, your, your field of interest in a really hands-on way. Um, 
yeah, this is just another image from the same uh, field trip in, um, in Egypt, in Cairo. And here we were looking at the, the water fountains uh, in the, um, yeah, the older part of the city. And uh, yeah, also tours, tours, tour guides are fantastic, I think, uh, in terms of experiential learning. And even if you know a city, I think it's really an amazing uh, discovery sometimes to have that narrated to you by, by others. Um, this was something more recent that I experienced. Um, so I was in Lithuania doing a teacher training trip and we had the chance to go to a recycling factory for plastic, uh, which is just on the outskirts of Vilnius in Lithuania. And there we saw how plastic bags, which you see here on the right hand side of the screen, are transported in, in these really big bales. Actually, you can buy one of those for 400 euro. And uh, they are then cleaned inside this plastic factory. Um, and just really, it was really fascinating, I thought, to see the entire process of this. Uh, something that I guess we don't actually see very often. Um, to actually like experience a, a factory setting, which was really dirty and 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 incredibly stinky um, as well. I mean, we watched how people were uh, washing these plastic bags and how they went through this whole process of um, being transformed into little recycled plastic pellets. And then we also watched how the water that was used to in this whole factory process was then on the left hand side filtered through through really um, kind of rudimentary machine and then uh, the water that was coming from the whole plastic factory was then being filtered somewhat and then um, it, it actually it was uh, going back into the water system of the city so it was really uh, kind of I found it really interesting because when we buy recycled plastic of course we think of that being like doing something really uh, great, uh, doing a good service to the environment. But in fact, yeah, we forget about the very grimy process which is involved in the recycling of that plastic to be able to reuse it again and the sort of washing of that. And this is a whole plus, uh, project actually I'm doing about microplastics, which then of course find their way into the water system and uh, can be very harmful. So. I mean, just something as simple as just a little peek inside of a factory, I think can really, yeah, actually change your perspective um, on the things that you're buying and sort of like the, um, yeah, I mean, we think we're, we're doing a good thing buying recycled stuff, but we forget a lot of the, the process that goes into it, of course. And then this is just some shots from inside of the factory. Um, and in fact, the <laughs> sort of, uh, yeah, basically what happens inside the other part of the factory, which is more clean and um, uh, yeah, a little bit maybe what I would expect to see inside a factory um, was actually manufacturing again the recycled plastic bags uh, from, the, from the little pellets um, that are the source material. So it was really fascinating to see the whole entire process. So for all of you, um, just some thoughts on what constitutes an institution. Um, so that could be a government uh, or government funded organization, festivals or events, NGOs, charities, self-organized community groups, uh, educational groups, commercial enterprises, uh, experts and non-experts. And uh, Nelly Oya says that she is training students to become the next president of, of uh, a country. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're up for it, I mean, that's, uh, that's also an option. Um, yeah, just to say that it's, it's a broad definition of an institution. Um, well, as far as I know and how it's been before, I, I, I think it's still the same. Uh, maybe uh, Aggie also has some ideas about that. Um, so, uh, how to do this basically, um, yeah, this is quite challenging. If you've never done that before, it can also be pretty intimidating to approach, uh, experts or outsiders who you don't know. 
Um, maybe one little tip, uh, there are many talks and um, lecture programs organized by the University of the Underground. And this is just like the range of the different people that we invited to take part in the symposium, which is, I think, regular practice at the beginning of the uh, UU projects that there are a bunch of people that are invited to contribute. So here you have like our tour guide that we met in Egypt, perhaps a, a professor from the University in Cairo, a, a journalist, a community groups, etc. And in fact, it's it's a really great idea for you as students to actually think of those as also part of your network, people who you can then approach very easily if they're already connected to the University of the Underground. Um, some of the types of collaborations that, that we've experienced, um, this is a shot from the Repeat After Me project, which was actually a collaboration, um, which Alex will also talk a little bit more about, but uh, this is Ryan Eckholt, one of the students at the, at the time, and this was a whole project uh, that him and his group did in collaboration with Milieu Defensi, which is an environmental group that uh, leads campaigns against uh, shell fracking. And what they did is, is to um, have several meetings with the NGO and to talk to them about the projects that they're doing related to shell. And eventually this, because it was a brief that was also connected to the Dutch uh, National Opera, this was eventually their findings were kind of scripted into, into an opera piece. Uh, and here you see shell on the arm of the costume, but I mean, yeah, I, interesting to to yeah see how this project evolved into a kind of more uh, poetic gesture, um, especially considering that our collaborator at that time was both the NGO that the students were um, working with, but also the Dutch National Opera, where this was presented actually as the the final uh, dissemination of the project. Um, here is slightly different uh, variety of collaboration. This is uh, Talita Virginia's project, um, and she is a student at the Nonlinear Narrative Program in The Hague. And um, she did a series of interviews with uh, this lady, Dr. Harum, Dr. Lindsay Harum, who's based in the United States, who wrote something called a plastic, plasticine lexicon. Um, and uh, she worked together with uh, Lindsay Harum. Here she's doing uh, interviews online, which is, of course, uh, the reality that most of you might face if you want to work with interviews in your project is that, uh, well, they'll probably be online, which gives you definitely some challenges in terms of uh, sound quality and, um, yeah, just ways of engagement with the collaborator that you're going to be working with. Um, so she, she uh, had several conversations with Lindsay Harum, um, who, well, it says here, she is a um, expert on geological, ecological systems. Um, she's, a, she's a scientist. Um, so through these conversations, Talita actually uh, picked up on several uh, words from the lexicon which she was developing related to plastic. This is again the microplastics uh, theme coming through. Um, and the two of them actually discussed a lot of the vocabulary that Lindsay Harum was, was working on uh, because a lot of these words such as plasticine, uh, plastivore, etc., are all new words actually in our vocabulary. So they discussed a lot of these, these words and uh, Talita was really actively working together with her to also think about words that are missing. Um, and eventually, um, as an outcome for this collaboration, they developed the plastivore um, dictionary. And these are a couple of words that came out of this uh, plasticlomerate, maybe some of you have heard of plastic crust, uh, plastosphere, as I mentioned, and all of these are yeah, new words that are becoming more and more important because they have, um, yeah, more uh, impact on our daily lives. Uh, so by this collaboration, this was a, a method of kind of um, crystallizing the words, but also thinking about ways of illustrating them or communicating them. And in this case, disseminating the information within the context of an exhibition. Um, and actually what's, what's kind of interesting about this exhibition as well is that um, it took place at a, a conference 
um, where these words were shown and also uh, seen by a lot of different NGOs who are actually engaged in the field. So in that way, it created kind of a nice feedback loop um, between, let's say, the, the people who she uh, was collaborating with, plus also the work that she was uh, involved in, and then also the discussions that were had and possibly also the continuation of the project. So it's also something nice to think about is that um, through these collaborations, you can also build relationships that can uh, continue further than you know, just the project that you're working on, but can also be a source for future projects, for example, or future jobs. Um, yeah, or yeah, just networking in general. Um, so also uh, some, some thoughts around um, who to include and when. Um, and these four, four points, I mean, I won't go too deeply into it, but uh, these are, you could say, the four phases of any kind of artistic, um, you know, design research, uh, artistic research project. So the idea that first you are generating knowledge, so gathering and harvesting information, then safeguarding knowledge, meaning taking that information that you've gathered and kind of organizing it, analyzing it, um, reordering it, um, looking at it critically. Then uh, the third one, releasing knowledge, which is, um, I would say, when artistic experimentation, prototyping, um, maybe material experiments, um, and really crystallizing your research question, and also uh, thinking about an approach to an artistic outcome could come in. And then transferring knowledge would be thinking about how you want to show your project or your outcome within an exhibition setting, for example, or maybe making a website that you might distribute it online or a video that you try to distribute online or social media or whatever. Uh, but also in this phase, kind of testing what the feedback is of the project. Okay, so that was very briefly four phases. But then I think why I add this in here is to think about um, in what stage do you want actually the collaborative partner to come into the picture? Do you want that to be in the initial phase where you might be asking an expert about a certain topic that you're interested? Or would you prefer uh, something more in the dissemination phase? And I think Alex's project, which he will speak about, is, is really interesting in terms of incorporating the knowledge production in the initial phases, but then also bringing in your institutional collaborator in a later context as well during the dissemination or the actual like manifestation of the artistic outcome or the performance in your case. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it's also up to you when to initiate uh, the process. Um, and we always have the problem of time, of course, that we don't have enough time to really build relationships before actually working with people. And I think that is also something, you know, to consider and, and, and also to think about critically because uh, to involve someone in a really short period and then expect a lot from them is maybe a bit too much. But um, yeah, you can also still be a little bit more conscious of what role, let's say, your collaborator would play in which part of your project. Um, so just some thoughts on how to collaborate. So as I said, um, if you have um, so let's say a scientist that you want to work from that you'd be asking for knowledge, then you might do that in the form of an interview or what I've also experienced um, with students is more of a workshop setup when uh, several individuals are invited to one particular place where you, everybody might be invited to contribute with something. So then maybe the threshold for exchange of information uh, between non-experts is then a bit lower where you're just sharing and talking and it's more of a dialogue and an exchange that is kind of casual. Um, another way of thinking about it is in terms of co-creation. So um, where both parties, your, yourself and um, your external uh, 
collaborator might have a joint interest in producing something together. So um, then it's more of a, yeah, kind of a, a, a joint investment in making a publication or, um, yeah, for example, the, the lexicon that was made or the, the plastic uh, dictionary would also be, in fact, a win-win situation on both sides that the scientists might also like to publish or publicize their own research using that of the artists. So I think, um, yeah, it could be really nice to think about collaboration in term, more in terms, terms of co-creation than um, sort of an un, unequal collaboration in that sense that you're just asking for information uh, from someone else. Um, another way to do that is to really consider the, the services that you or that you could maybe offer someone, um, for example, uh, in a way with pain, like you could say it's almost like paying someone like, hey, I could do some design for you if you could uh, teach me about community work or how to, um, I don't know, uh, do some kind of like technical uh, thing that I'm not sure how to do. So you could also think of it as a sort of more an exchange uh, in that sense of offering a service that you could possibly give to them. Um, yeah, then uh, this is just a, a shot from a, a project that I worked in, on in South Africa. And um, just to say that interviews could be online, but it could also be that you just do interviews on the street. Actually, this was, um, well, it's a, it would be a really long story to explain it all now, but these were interviews that were done with a community group by just like walking around with a microphone and literally like asking people um, in the streets that were outside of their homes what they thought about a specific monument which was built in that area so i've also known um, more in a like european context that uh, students might walk around the streets and, and ask people uh, in the streets just what they think of certain things uh, collecting information in that way could also be um, really fruitful uh, maybe slightly awkward if you're not into that kind of thing but um yeah it doesn't have to be something which is uh really sort of like um set up in this kind of like traditional interview way that you could also think of different ways of of doing the interview um and then yeah this example i included because uh, i think it's quite interesting in terms of bringing together different collaborators at one time so this was um, a project that we did in Istanbul where students were working on their own in in independent projects um, in the city of Istanbul. This was during the time of the biennial, which was going on then, the di design biennial. Um, and then collaborators were basically brought into one venue and then uh, they recorded, um, we were recording actually a radio show at the same time. So it was kind of a combination of bringing together different kinds of projects and collaborators and recording all of that to a broader audience at the same time. So quite interesting in terms of um, live experience, bringing together people plus creating content to be distributed all simultaneously. Uh, some tips. Uh, I think it's always useful if you don't have very much time to conduct your, your project. I guess that you will all have a, a couple of months, it is, like two or three months. Um, I could be wrong there. Uh, but I would say if you'd like to uh, work with someone quite intensively, introduce yourself as soon as you can. And that is not only to get information from someone very quickly or to be able to use it for your project, but also to create trust. Uh, between you and the collaborator, um, which I think is really essential in terms of both people also feeling comfortable with the, the exchange. Um, understand the benefit for both of you, for yourself as an artistic practitioner, but also for the other external party who you're working with. Um, and to also make that explicit. So to really talk about that issue, sort of what's, what's in it for you, what's in it for me, and how can, we, how can this exchange work upfront? 
Um, if you are doing interviews, I think it's always really, or any kind of exchange really, it's always useful to um, create one meeting, which is just a, an initial um, like meet and greet, and then to plan in uh, other meetings once you understand how the person could fit into your project or your needs. So to set up basically multiple meetings. Uh, creating a timeline of expectations uh, for both sides. Uh, that's especially if you'd like extensive participation um, from the other collaborator. Uh, I think it's really good to state that up front um, before you get started and also just to, yeah, to avoid that your collaborator maybe disappears on you. Um, prioritize less interactions, or, oh, sorry, like uh, quality interactions. Um, and also, uh, I would say use the subjectivity of your of the person that you're working with. Um, that's also, I think, something about artistic practice, which is uh, really special uh, if you compare that to to journalism, is that you're not aiming to to produce sort of like a really objective um, project or anything, and the the subjectivity of the person that you're going to be working with is also an important factor to remember um, if you're going to be using their information and their stories, uh, for example. Um, so these are just some, some tips. Um, remember to document the whole process because of course it could be uh, equally valuable for your, um, your con the content and the harvesting of the content, but also uh, in the final outcome too. Uh, be respectful of the collaborators, collaborators time and their circumstances and remember to credit everybody in your um, in your credit list at the end of a video or on your website or whatever to make sure that you yeah that you acknowledge everybody who's helped you along the way and also share and test your final outcomes with the person or persons that you'll be collaborating with. So yeah, just some really practical tips actually. Um, and I'm sure that Alex will do a great job in talking in more detail about um, the specifics of the collaboration that he was working on during his time at the University of the Underground. So Alex, do you wanna take it away from here? I would love to. Okay. Yay. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Uh, real quick, Vic, do I have sharing? I can share, yeah? Yeah, everyone can okay. share now. Oh, great. Should be. Best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. I shall uh, share, and I shall also share sound because that is important. Cool. You all can see that, yeah? Mm hmm Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm actually really happy you mentioned fieldwork because, um, yeah, that's really applicable to to this project. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, as a as a as a case study, guys, I wanted to share a work that um, I did with uh, a classmate, um, yeah, now very close friend, Tom Tom Burke. And I did this project for a uh, brief during uh, our master's program, repeat after me. And I was actually trying to find the brief uh, right now to see how long it was. And I think it was maybe three and a half months long um, from beginning from beginning to end. Uh, so I definitely think it's it's possible for um, quick relationships to to develop. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. Yes. Yeah, so um, Mena Muria uh, is the name of, of this work, which is about a group of Moroccan Thai kickboxers in, in the Netherlands. Um, and this was the institution that uh, Tom and I reached out to. Um, this is the institution that was involved uh, most, actually most of the way throughout the four phases of a project that, that Lauren shared. Um, these guys were heavily involved in at least three of them, um, if not all, if not all four. Uh, I think. And oh, 
Cool. Yes. Yes. So this is, uh, these guys are the Moluccan fighters. Um, I became interested in um, Moluccan, uh, the Moluccan fighters, um, and actually the Moluccan um, experience and uh, relationship with the Netherlands. Um, if you're unfamiliar, which maybe a lot of you are, uh, Maluku is an island in Indonesia. Indonesia was a colony of the Netherlands, of the Dutch, for, for quite some time. Now, during the Second World War, um, the islands of Indonesia shift, uh, shifted from Dutch to Japanese. And then after the war, the Dutch were like, hey, we want you back. Uh, and Indonesia said, no, uh, we'd rather much be independent. Thank you very much. Uh, so the Dutch uh, conscripted a bunch of uh, uh, islanders from Maluku to be part of the Dutch kind of colonial army and kind of fight against uh, Indonesia uh, for the Dutch. So it was kind of like a, a civil war situation. And after the Indonesians won their independence, um, all the Moluccans realized that, well, shit, I mean, we kind of were against ourselves in, in this, in this uh, civil war. And the Dutch said, well, hey, why don't you come on to the Netherlands and, and you'll be cool until, you know, the things uh, even out, you can go back home. Um, unfortunately for, for this group, when they got here um, and they were kind of uh, not treated very well, they were put into homes outside of city centers. Um, like, for instance, there's a camp in a city called Vlucht um, in the Netherlands, and it's an old Nazi concentration camp that the Moluccans were, were living in when they first arrived here in the 19, yeah, late 1940s, early 1950s. Um, they weren't really allowed to participate in a lot of the Dutch systems that were happening, uh, like education for, for a really good example. Um, so the, the first generation of Moluccans were like, yes, okay, this is happening. The second generation of Moluccans became a little bit radical, like in, this, in the late 60s and, and 70s. Um, there were a few instances of, uh, well, like the first instances of terror, terrorism, and I'm putting those in, in quotes um, because, I mean, what is terrorism in this case? Uh, but the, the second generation of Moluccans felt very unseen and decided to take it into their own hands to be seen and to demand um, participation in the society that they found themselves stuck in. Um, this third generation of Moluccans um, are now interested in, in combating this invisibility, but also combating this uh, kind of bad rep that got um, nationwide after the events of, of the 70s. Um, case in point, Moluccan fighters. Now, Moluccan fighters is run by this guy. Uh, his name is uh, Tika. Yeah, yeah, Tika Mahitu. Is, is his name. Um, this guy looks so, number one, badass, and number two, immensely, um, yeah, intimidating, because uh, he's just like this, this very built man that just beats the shit out of people for a, a living. And he has won multiple like, world championship belts. But he's actually a really sweet man um, that really didn't take long to, uh, <laughs> to reach out. Uh, and to form a relationship with. And, and I think for me, um, I s reached out to these, uh, to these group of people because I felt, um, yeah, I, I felt that their story kind of resonated with me, just given my history in the United States, in the United States history with African-Americans and the Latino population, um, and just basically everyone that's non-white. Um, and feeling this kind of, yeah, similarities of identity loss or identity finding. Uh, with the Moluccans, it's a lot more recent. Uh, for me, not so much more recent, but the, the core of, I think, our interests align. Uh, so maybe that's a suggestion to you when you're looking for institutions. Possibly you could um, look for institutions that you align with um, that might make your uh, relationship develop a little bit faster. And also, I think in the case of the plastics um, uh, project uh, that, that Lauren that Lauren's thought into, that there was a, a very clear um, connection um, that really developed the, the relationship to, to levels beyond. Uh, but yeah, so in, in my case, I just reached out um, 
and really it was, boom, I, I am interested in this thing. I noticed you have a, a seminar coming up. Can I attend and can we talk? Uh, boom, yeah, it was great. Like it was like, yes, you may. Uh, so then this is kind of where the field work uh, that Lauren mentioned comes into play. Because uh, I think with field work, um, a lot of really interesting things happen. Not only can you engage with, with the field, uh, so to speak, um, but you can also engage with alternate forms of documentation too. Um, and you can get creative and, and playful with, with how you document and how you use that documentation within the process work. Uh, so yes, so we went to this, this seminar um, where a lot of men uh, and, and women and also children um, of all ages too, there were even like a few elderly, uh, elderly people too uh, that were really interested in this. Um, so we go and we're there for this field work, we're recording sounds um, that we're later using in our works. Uh, we're, we're, we're viewing, you know, people, people sparring. And uh, Tom, with his field recorder, started recording some very, very interesting and, and fascinating uh, sounds of boxing gloves hitting other boxing gloves. Uh, so we decided to use that um, in a song that we featured in the opera that was later to, yeah. Uh, and I think, can you guys hear this? Yeah, okay, cool. I won't play the rest of that because it goes on. But the only sounds that were not found from uh, were part of the field work uh, was the bass line and the little like toms. Everything else, the the snare, um, the hi hat, even in in that in that instrumental. Um, obviously, you hear some voices. All of that is documentation of the time that we went to the seminar. That is all like found sounds from from the field work. So I think it's really interesting as you engage with your institutions, um, how can you document in ways that uh, one, because uh, yeah, how can you document in ways that you can feed back into your, into your own work? Because I also think that is a form of institutional engagement as well. Um, but yes, okay, so moving on, we went to the seminar we recorded sounds and then we started talking to people and then um, the, this whole story, this whole uh, immensity, um, we became very intimately close with this vastness of the Moluccan experience within the Netherlands, just simply by talking to people. Um, and it's really fun to do and really, it leads to really interesting things and people always love talking about themselves and their experience and how they view the world. Um, so I, I think it's actually really, really easy to get people to open up as long as you're asking the right questions. Um, in this case, uh, this one of the members, Noah, said this like really, really beautiful quote, which is the reason why he kickboxes and is the reason why he is part of this part of this group. Um, yeah, we've been fighting for others since the first sales appeared on the horizon, uh, meaning colonization. Um, my people don't know what it feels like to be free and he's he's doing kickboxing and he has this platform of uh, of kickboxing and teaching others how to kickbox um, and this is freedom for him this is this is liberation and in this sense kickboxing is a, is a radically political act um, and all of that comes from the field working comes from engaging within the institution um, other kind of like institutional engagement along the steps of creation uh, during our interviewing process and just generally hanging out with Mika and everyone else. Um, we learned that when the Moluccans arrived to the Netherlands, uh, their identity within the Dutch military was something that they were very proud of um, and something that gave them a very good base um, for um, Every single one of them that traveled to the Netherlands, it was like returning home. 
uh, is is what we uh, yeah is what we were told. Um, and then they receive this letter, um, and this letter basically is telling them that they are no longer part of the Dutch military. That this they they arrive to, to the Netherlands and then they all receive this letter that's like, hey, you're you're no longer part of this thing. Uh, this identity that you are so proud of, that you, um, yeah, that you are ingrained with, is is suddenly is suddenly gone. So we use this letter. We well, we found a copy of this letter, obviously, as you can see, and then we use this letter within the actual performance itself. Um, yes. So that leads us to the day of the performance. Now, I, um, I had written the libretto, like the, the text, uh, and Tom had written all of the music. Um, and I, I used the story of, of Icarus and, and his wax wings um, and moths, especially, to kind of describe this, uh, yeah, this, this struggle of the Moluccans, and also maybe the struggle that I also uh, have felt um, of attempting to do a thing, attempting to achieve visibility or attempting to achieve freedom um, and having your wings burnt and having your wings melted before you can even reach there. So I'm kind of retelling the story of Icarus as not a story of pride and, and boast. Uh, maybe Icarus didn't fly too close to the sun with his wax wings because he wanted everybody to see him. Um, maybe he flew too close to the sun with his wax wings because he was cold. Um, and if you're cold, you're going to go towards the warmth. But as soon as you get to the warmth, as soon as you get to the spot where you want to be, that very thing is the thing that destroys you. Um, yeah. So uh, with, with this, um, actually, I think Mika, I'm not, I'm not sure who initiated this, this idea. Uh, it, it, it was either myself or Mika, or maybe it was both of us at the same time. Um, but very quickly, Mika became super interested in what Tom and I were doing. He became super involved in what we were doing, and he definitely wanted to be part of the performance it's, itself. Which I think, as far as like institutional engagement is concerned, this is like top notch. I, I, I think this is something that maybe we all, we all desire. Um, but yeah, so I he had an equal part and this whole thing, because I did the libretto, Tom did the music, and then Mika ended up contributing to the mise en scene, or like the, the movement. Um, and we entitled this uh, performance uh, Mena Moria, uh, which means I go, you follow, because it is the uh, slogan or the, the motto for the, um, let's see, what is, what is it? The uh, Moluccan independent, yeah, geez. Hold on, I'm going to Google this real quick. Uh, because the Moluccans did win their independence and they do have a nation, uh, but it's kind of like a, a landless nation. The, the, yes, the Republic of uh, South Peluku, um, which exists and also doesn't exist. But uh, their their motto, there's their, yeah, their motto is Menemuria, I go, you follow. It's a kind of call and response thing um, that one person says it and then everybody else uh, replies, Muria. Uh, yeah. So we decided to kind of mimic this call and response uh, by having Mika be the person that asks if I'm going and me responding by, yes, I'm following uh, just by just by our movements. Uh, yeah. It's another picture of us. I'm a horrible boxer. Um, you can tell by my form. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, so here's just a short clip. Uh, there is no sound, uh, and that's okay. Um, but yeah, th so this performance was really amazing for me, and also for, for Mika. Um, he got a lot out of it. He brought his wife, he brought his kid. Um, I think he even brought some other members of the kickboxing group. Um, he gave me this black shirt, which is also really, really nice. Um, and it all kind of just stemmed from me asking about him uh, and his history and his experience um, and how his organization as an institution is, is fitting into the greater context of the Netherlands. Um, and then also allowing myself to be vulnerable enough to relate to, to this experience. And I think, uh, yeah, this is actually what Lauren, well, this is, 
Nor, did you share the slide yet? I didn't do anything. My, oh, I, okay. think, I think that's... Uh, you, but you didn't talk about this before, did you? Like, I did, you know? I did. Okay, great. So, um, yes, I, so... I think, uh, Go ahead. I will, yeah, yeah. I will just reiterate uh, because documentation, documentation, documentation is so so important. Um, you're going to be hearing it so many times from 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 Nelly also. Um, but I think my key, what I want you to take away from from this is one, uh, definitely like start early with your institutional engagement um, because the, the sooner you start, the easier it becomes. Um, and number two, this doesn't have to be like a huge, we're not trying to save the planet. I don't know, maybe some of you are, but the, your institution doesn't have to be like the BBC or um, Excel recordings or something like that. It could be something as simple as a local community uh, Moroccan kickboxing group who are actually trying to do something really, really important within their community. Um, Number two, to kind of go back to Lauren's like four phases, I, I would definitely try to get, I would personally try to get the institution to be involved in as many of those phases as, as possible. Um, because that way you can allow yourself uh, a, a chance to deepen the relationship so that the relationship kind of extends beyond the project. And, and when that happens, um, I think, yeah, I think that's the, the very best outcome. Uh, in my case, yeah, Mika and I are pretty much still in touch. We're not doing much work anymore because he, he has like four kids now, which is, he's just an extremely busy man, uh, which is which is fair. And also your documentation process, um, yeah, get weird with your documentation, get creative. Uh, think about alternate ways of documenting outside of just pictures and video. And maybe that sound, um, maybe you could do like a poetic documentation of, of, of an event and use that in your work. Um, but yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's all I have to say about this. Um, are there any questions about this case study specifically before we, before we move on to, to other things? It's okay if, there, if, it, if there's not. I'm going to stop sharing, actually. Well, cool, hey. cool. Yeah, have, well, great. I have a question. I, I was just oh, thinking yeah. of how to word it. Um, I was just wondering how, by the way, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, how engaging with the um, Moluccan kickboxing uh, space, but at the same time also engaging with the uh, opera, as an institution, mm -hmm. how those two, um, yeah, played a role into your institutional critique, let's say. So engaging with two at, at a time, if that makes uh, sense. Yeah, no, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think for, for me, um, well, for us, uh, we were kind of fortunate because the, uh, sometimes during our course, the institution, there was an institution that was ingrained within the brief itself. In this case, um, the Dutch National Opera House was already uh, inherently part of, of, it was part of the, the skeletal structure of the, of the brief. Um, with that said, it did create a lot of really beautifully poetic moments of tension, right? Like in this case, um, the Dutch National Opera House, and, and this is just my own projection of, of this, this isn't what they represent. But to me, um, just as like a person of, of color, the Dutch National Opera House, and opera in general represents kind of this very uh, traditional kind of like uh, space dominated by, by whiteness and, and colonialism. And then we have, you know, this, we have Mika coming in and like kickboxing within the context of the Dutch National Opera House. So I, yeah, it, it leads to like really, really nice poetic moments like like that. Um, but I guess to more specifically to attempt to answer your question, um, I, I think uh, if the Dutch National Opera House were not ingrained within the, the brief itself, I'm not sure that this would have happened at at, at, the, at the National Opera, unless I had some kind of network already. 
Um, or unless I started that very, very early with like this, I want this to happen at the opera house because of, I want to make a statement about X. Um, then, yeah, then it's a little bit different because then the opera house just becomes part of the phase four and you only build the relationship specifically to that point. Whereas with uh, Mika, um, I wanted him throughout the whole process. I wanted him to inform the work. Um, I wanted him to be part of the outcome as well. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, it, it, also going back to Lauren's four phases, I think just be, when you're thinking about institutions, just be very clear with yourself of how you want that engagement to look like, because um, that's going to determine your communication chain from here into the end of, of the thing. Did I answer your question? Does that? Yes, thank you. I may, remember, Alex, another thing uh, about that brief was the idea of reenactment. Um, yeah. That was yeah. because it was called repeat after me. And that was also quite interesting. For me, it was the first time ever to go to the opera uh, in the Netherlands. And I found it a really interesting experience because um, you have like these very old stories that are reenacted within a contemporary context and also so many layers of um translation coming through like you have the actors on stage you have the live music you have the um translation in text from italian to what was it to english i guess on the screens mm -hmm. so it's just such a Dy dynamic i mean i never was ever interested in opera but then I, it was r really such an explosion yeah, and I guess cool. like that, that also influenced the sort of format that you, that you took in the end, of course. Um, and that was, it was a very demanding brief for students to deal with, eh? to be like, okay, you're a design student or an artist, and you're going to make an opera. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah, it was really quite an adventure, but um, yeah, in terms of bringing together and, and in a way, maybe compromising a lot or kind of changing or forming um, your outcome according to the, the space where we presented it in the end. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, because I think when we're thinking about designing an outcome, um, yeah, especially if we're working with an institution, um, there are definitely, yeah, you, you might need to compromise a thing or change a thing. Um, Cause if you're engaging an institution and you're wanting to work with an institution, um, it just as if, you know, I'm building up a space in a physical location um, and I need to adjust how I'm building because of the physical limitations of where I am. Um, and this also happens with an institutional engagement. Like maybe I need to shift the way I'm communicating, or maybe I need to shift my project a little bit to fit the spaces that I, I now found myself, that I find myself in. Uh, yeah, good, good shout, Lauren. Yeah. Cool. Do you, do you have any um, prescribed um, collaborators so far? Not, not really, right? You can choose everything for yourselves. Okay, cool. Do you have any ideas so far, anyone? Awesome. <laughs> also, also fine. Yeah. Uh, if, if I can ask you something, because uh, since we're getting specific about our our task, we we have like a literally like scary kind of task that's like you know could could also be scary for the institution uh, mm -hmm. somehow. Um, and and our our brief talks about you know subverting and exposing the darkest spots of the institution we we choose. Mm. So I was you know I was relating it to your work, which is wonderful by the way, and thank you for talking about it. And I was like, of course it's reenact them reenactment your brief, and, and you're like as as I can see like basically telling a story and exposing a lot of interesting social political dynamics through it, but Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, if, if I got it kind of right, you're not like challenging the kickboxing um, club as an institution. And, and I feel like what this program is pushing us to do is to challenge the institution we choose in its like scariest and darkest parts mm -hmm. and, and the parts that can be like uh, more like towards we could be like more critical. So I was wondering. Do you feel like that makes it um, like 
uh, different the kind of approach we should have like that maybe the experts and people we get into are people that are external of the institution we are you know talking about i don't know if it's clear what's my doubt here mm. Yes, yeah. if I can say just one last thing is yes, I've been doing a research project when I was at the university about platform capitalism and I had to work about a specific institution and I did my field work. But of course, I wasn't like 100% transparent with the institution I was researching about and I was doing more kind of like, you know, journalistic uh, investigation kind of work and then I, I got in like experts that were having a already critical view or and you know what i mean so that's my my doubt mm -hmm. here mm. yeah well i, I just a, a quick um flashback uh, alex to that opera brief again and the work that um was it ryan no not ryan um um um, um uh, J um What's his name again? Oh no, <laughs> from the UK, not Joe, Jack, 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 was, and, Luke. Uh, Jack and Luke, they, yeah. they were doing their project um, about Deliveroo, so they actually, as their institution, they became, uh, or Luke was a Deliveroo driver um, or rider uh, for a while, um, in order to really sort of like experience what that was like, because I mean, speaking of, um, platform capitalism. Um, so yeah, I think that it, that the form of the collaboration, I think is really up to you. Um, mm -hmm. I do understand Nelly's approach in terms of saying, um, and may maybe the, the example that I gave of the girl working with the scientist and making the plastic uh, dictionary was, was probably for Nelly's taste a bit of a soft collaboration. Um, I think the way that she sees it is a lot more kind of like about infiltration and, and slightly more um, bold, um, which is up to you. I mean, I think that it's already, I, I believe you have two or three months, no? This is not incorrect because I, I didn't i didn't look it's, at it it's more it's we've got until oh, yeah. the 20 the presentation is the 24th of march we have to oh, do oh, the, wow. the first presentation on the 4th of february i think okay and then you haven't uh, you have more time after february so that's that's great that's really great news um you can do a lot uh in that time um yeah, so think think carefully about where you want to take that and in what direction, because it does take time to set up all these, these collaborations. It takes time to reach out. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of experience with making the symposiums for the University of the Underground. And it's like you, you start with a long list of people who you think are really interesting of like maybe 20, 30 people. And then you end up with you know yeah it's difficult to get hold of people to engage people to find people who are accessible enough but then also on point with, with regards to to what you want to explore as well um and who have time etc so it's it's quite challenging um so you know and i, I think you know all collaborations are welcome so don't i wouldn't stress too much about being kind of too um you have to be strategic. Look, nobody is going to invite you into the institution knowing that you're going to do like a smashing critique on them and ruin them. Nobody's going to do that. So either you go undercover and mm -hmm. you sort of like bluff your way through it or um, you find a way. And I think Luke's way of kind of becoming a del delivery uh, biker himself led him to have access to uh the sort of like meeting points where all the other drivers meet he could speak to them and check their experiences he had like a um, i don't know a boss or whatever who he checked in with so yeah it's sort of like a it doesn't have to be it can also be a light version of infiltration i would say mm -hmm. i don't know what you think alex do you disagree no no i don't disagree <laughs> um i i uh, don't disagree at all um and to kind of just kind of follow up with that um, and maybe like speak to your point about the um, the nature of the brief and, and horror and finding like the deepest, darkest, uh, the corners of, uh, I, I'm not, don't exactly remember your, your exact terminology, but 
this repeat after me brief was about reenacting an institution's trauma, I believe. Um, so oh, yeah. already, like, it's, you can't just go to an institution and be like, yo, what's up? What's your trauma? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really about being uh, strategic um, and finding the, the right angles of communication and the right level of infiltration also you'd, you'd want to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, I mean, do you guys have, like, do you guys have, an in, do you know what you're interested in working with? Do you have, like, research questions or research areas or topics so far that you're interested in? Because uh, as soon as you, I think as soon as you find out that, um, it's going to be a lot easier to figure out the strategies of communication and infiltration that you want to take with the institutions that you engage with. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe in three days, Alex. <laughs> What's that? Maybe in three days. It's day three. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. Hello. <laughs> so, um, thank you for that as well, because it gives um, a lot of thought behind my processes of I'm thinking of collaborating more with um, the farm industry. I'm from New Zealand. And so we have a massive dairy farming industry, which um, has its pros and cons in both sides. So that was quite interesting food for thought about how to approach that um so thank you very much yeah you're welcome you're very welcome mm -hmm. it's daylight where you are yeah no that's nice <laughs> james yeah i've got to go to work soon get ready for work it's so opposite to you guys <laughs> yeah what time is it there uh it's 10 past eight in the morning oh wow. Good morning. So, like, yeah, the classes yes. have been great. The induction was a bit hard. I did like 11 p.m. till 7 a.m., like an all-nighter, but it's been amazing. It's yeah. so worth it. Cheers on you. Yeah. Yeah, well thanks, done. Thanks for your time, guys. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, are there any other questions? We will see everyone again, I think. Alex, are we doing a sesh again? Um, I don't know if we're doing one together, no. Maybe. I do have a question, just a quick one, if there's yeah. time. Um, did you know of anyone when you were doing your brief who had a lot of resistance from the institution they'd chosen and like how they solved that kind of challenge? Um, that's a good one. That's a good one, yeah. Um, I don't think so, actually. No, I'm also trying to think, <laughs> like, over the course of the of the master's program too. Yeah, no, I'm also trying to think. I don't think so. I mean, I think um, uh, people disappear. That can happen. Like, you speak to someone and you want to talk to them again or whatever, and then they just like ghost you. So that could happen. But I think that's pretty much the worst that. I mean, you of course have to be careful with what you what your outcome is, um, and credit pe credit everyone well. But I don't think we've had any issues with it so far, to be honest. Maybe Nettie would be a good one to ask because yeah. um, she's been doing all the programs, so she has more experience. Yeah. I can't think of anything. Well, I did get um, when I did my um, uh, when I did my graduation work uh which i'm not going to talk much about because it was neither here nor there but my institution uh was the uh, maritime museum in amsterdam uh and i remember like sitting down because uh, my intent was to discuss decolonizing museum spaces but then the project turned into something else um and i talked with the museum director and i got you know permission to record and i told her that i might use some of the recording for the final outcome. And the part that I ended up using was her saying this kind of like racist thing. And that's like literally the only thing that I used in my entire graduation project. <laughs> and I remember showing it to her and she got super pissed at me. Oh, yeah. uh, and if we don't talk anymore. I mean, that's fair. But I, th <laughs> I, I, I think maybe having moments like, like these 
are maybe also what uh, you'll you'll run into as far as like outcome and 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 things like that. Um, but yeah, I can't think of anything necessarily that. Uh, the, yeah. Perhaps that's a good point though, Alex, like if you're recording someone or doing an interview, it is good to ask them if they would mind. A lot of people don't, don't want to be um, on, on video or they don't want to be recorded. Um, but also that you could ask if you could use the, the content as part of your project. I mean, a, a documentary maker would might make um, their participants sign like a consent form. Mm -hmm. um, which you don't necessarily have to do, but I think it's good to ask for permission. Yeah, for sure. That's helpful. It's good to know that you can use something even from a, um, like maybe a slightly more kind of fractious interaction. Like if you, it's still something came out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could always, yeah, you could definitely always use, because also with that same thing, like I, only have like five seconds of video because I like accidentally turned my camera off or like forgot to hit record on a thing um, and was just found a way to, to use that as well. So yeah, I mean, you could definitely do that. Just make sure like Lauren said, get talk to people, get permission, uh, get the okay before you do stuff. Uh, and then if they get mad at you about what you use, then it's not like an ethical dilemma. It's just uh, they're upset. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Is that, okay. are we, is any, that good? Any more questions? Can we email you guys at any point these days about like questions? Sure. Um, like, yeah. Sure. I think, I think you have our emails. I don't know. Maybe. I can, I can share them with you in a, in a separate email. Okay. Thank you. That would be great. Right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Alrighty. All done. I'm going to stop the record button now. Cool. Cool, um, cool. Thank you very much, Lauren and Alexander, for coming. Yeah. Um, no problem. Yeah, wish you all a lovely evening. Or, yeah. I mean, James has gone day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, see you all soon.